I would like to uh, begin by asking you to think about this. To think about your ideal learning environment. So actually, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Go ahead, close your eyes. And think about this question. Think about your ideal learning environment. If you could, what would it look like? Especially, how would it feel? What are some of the words that you would use to describe how this environment looks? And now I'd like you to stand up, if you would. You can open your eyes and stand up. Go ahead. We need to exercise a little bit. And share some of your associations with the people around you. So this is a good chance. If you haven't introduced yourself yet, please introduce yourself. I'll give you 30 seconds. And share your answers. What is your ideal learning environment? What are some of the words you would use to describe it? OK, begin. 30 seconds. OK, time. OK. All right, now you can keep standing for this, not for the whole presentation, but please keep standing. I have another question. And this time, don't think about it, but just directly go to your neighbor who's next to you and describe your actual learning environment in school. And by school, I mean your junior high school or high school experience. What are some of the words, some of the uh, feelings, again, you would use to describe the physical environment or just the environment in general? OK, again, 30 seconds, begin. OK, good. All right? So what did you notice? You, can, you may sit down now. Thank you. You might feel a little better, too, right? Physically, you got to talk to people. Now, I did the same experiment with several of my classes over several semesters, and including at uh, this one just a few days ago with my students at Kansai Gaidai. And these are some of the answers that they came up with. And maybe they were similar to some of the ones you had. For the ideal learning environment, they said many different things, such as peacefulness, active. These are just words that they came up with. Mainly positive things. I love some of these, right? Small groups, laughing, curiosity, smile, kind teacher, no teacher. Right? <laughs> Motivated, authentic, dream, experience. Right? Mistakes are OK. Again, these were my Japanese students who came up with these. Variety, all sorts of different things. And maybe you had some of these. But is this similar to the actual education experience or the school experience that people have? And what do you think some of their answers were? What were some of your answers? Go ahead, shout them out. Sterile, <laughs> boring. boring. Ah, hold that thought. This was the first one they came up with, actually boring. <laughs> Give that woman a prize. But these are some of the others. And, and they had positive things, too. I, all I said is your school experience. Right? <laughs> right. 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 This one said, right, why do I have to study this? Silence. Oshiri ga itai. They come up with this, right? Only listening, taking notes. Felt, you know, school made me feel stupid. Forget everything after the test reading comics in class. They told me if you sit near the back, the teacher doesn't notice that you're reading comics. Playing the PlayStation. Uh, time is not their own, so they don't feel free. There's a sense of fear, and everything is timed, and there's bells to go to the next thing. So as we know, we know this intuitively, we know this through our experience, but there's a bit of a gap between how people like to learn and how they do learn and then the school experience. Not just in Japan, and not always in Japan, but of course, it's everywhere across the world. I also uh, ask him, when did you really learn the most? If I asked you, you know, kindergarten, grade school, high school, college, graduate school, when did you really think you were learning the most? And interestingly enough, this is not a scientific poll, but over 60% in my informal poll would say elementary school. Even though it's a long time ago, they still remember that that's the time when they learned a lot. And I ask them to visualize what elementary school looks like. And this is what they come up with, something like this. They sketch out ideas like this. This is an actual picture I took at Tokyo International School. And here are students not using textbooks, but they're self-directed. They're actually engaged, and they're learning, and they're helping each other. This is the new school, Doshisha International Academy uh, in Kyoto. This is, I think, uh, third grade or fourth grade class. They're not in class now. But you'll notice it's not individual desks, but groups, and they can move those chairs around to be two or three or six people or one carpet on the floor so they can totally uh, arrange as they need. And then this is the art class also at Doshisha International Academy. And this class is in English, by the way. But 
not just in Japan, we're not just talking about Japan, but across the world, as you go up to junior high, we begin to see the rows and the regiment, and you said uh, sterile. Uh, this looks pretty sterile, pretty orderly. And then we go to college, and especially some of our science classes in the early years look something like this. And this is designed, of course, to prepare us for the real world, where we listen and we take notes. But the real world looks more like this, doesn't it? Collaboration, discussing, which reminds everyone more of grade school, not sitting in a lecture. So when you see this, what, how do you feel? Do you want to sit here and take notes? How, how many people have read the book Brain Rules by Dr. John Medina? So I highly recommend it. It's in Japanese as well. As he says, there's no greater anti-brain environment than the classroom. And he says even worse things about the lecture hall. Now when I see it, a picture like that, <laughs> yeah, you laugh. You laugh because you made the connection intuitively, you know. If I just showed you a picture of chickens, you're not going to laugh, although they are a funny animal. But you saw the connection between the lecture hall and a group of, chick a group of chickens, because it's almost like we're asking the students to, you know, to wait for that little bit of food in terms of information that we give them. And then we hope at midterm they will produce a knowledge egg or something. But it's very, very uh, passive. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this book by Donald Bly. It came out 40 years ago with lots of evidence, especially evidence you know, based on the classes in, in the science curriculum, that said this method uh, is not effective at all. About the only thing it's good at is information transfer, but it's not better than other forms of information transfer. And it's really terrible at teaching understanding and changing behaviors and so on. And yet, this is still very common, especially in the larger universities and especially still here in Japan. So you may not know, but the word lecture, to lecture, is actually from reading. Because in the old days, of course, uh, we didn't have the internet, and we didn't even have uh, a lot of books. I mean, even when Gutenberg invented the printing press, it took hundreds of years after that before we had books everywhere. So you would come and someone would read a book. That was a long time ago. And still, even young people often at a conference will read a paper, hiding behind notes, a computer, and a lectern with students uh, in front of tables taking notes. But it's a very much a different world, isn't it? So how many of you like to learn on your own? Open source learning, self-education. This has been, it's not a new thing, but especially now with the internet, with YouTube, and of course, with TED. We can learn so much from TED and from, the, from online sources. So when we come together in the classroom, it should be for something different. So we know lecturing doesn't work, and we know that information transfer, even if you can get that and you assume students are listening, that's not really learning, is it? But things are changing. So this is an article from yesterday's newspaper which says, if you don't read Japanese, that classrooms are going more active, active learning. Although I realize it's ironic with a lecturer in the front, people taking notes. But this is what he's talking about. Things are changing slowly around the world. OK. But so what? This is the reality, though. Yes, we like to get rid of the lecture halls. But they're not going away anytime soon. So the question then is, how can we engage even though we are using a lecture hall? Something like this. So there are a few things I'd like to go over very briefly. One is variety. So this is Dr. John Medina. He's Metsa Genki. And he knows the brain very well. But as he says, if keeping someone's attention in a lecture was a business, it would have an 80% failure rate. We, we all know that intuitively. It's sort of like complaining about the weather. Everyone does it, but no one's doing anything about it. So a lot of lectures are one hour or 90 minutes. Now, th have you been in a boring lecture ever in your life? Anyone? Not this one, of course, but I mean other ones. <laughs> and the re Watch it. Anyway, a lot of lectures are like very didactic, just speaking, speaking, and then at the end, questions, right? And then the professor says, And you think, I'm the greatest teacher in the world. They have no questions. So Nicholas Negroponte, who many Tedsters will know, of course, as the founder of MIT Media Lab, he said 25 years ago that good education has got to be good entertainment. And he doesn't mean the superfluous or the decorative, but that you have to engage students. Variety is one of those ways. So what could you do? We all have different things we could do. You could have an interactive presentation by the instructor first, very interactive, followed by active discussion, followed by activity that the students do. Then you could have more discussion on that. Maybe you have a video, a TED video perhaps. More discussion and maybe a summary, Q&A, something at the end. That's just one way. There are many things that you can do besides just the boring lecture. Most lectures and many classes don't ask students to do something. But we want to do, not just listen, right? Don't you want to do? 
So what did Confucius say about that? Remember this old chestnut, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. This should be plastered on the door of every school in the world. Students should be doing. We should be tapping into their natural curiosity and exploration. And my favorite spaceman, <laughs> my favorite uh, scientist in, from the United States, Dr. Neil deGrasse, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, has a great uh, little quote about this. Those kids are born curious. They're always exploring. We spend the first year of their lives teaching them how to walk and talk. And the rest of their lives tell them to shut up and sit down. <laughs> yep. Don't get them started. But it's true, isn't it? So why not this idea of having students teach? How many of you are teachers? Just curious. Teachers and teachers, lecturers, professors, some of you. How many of you have your, te your students actually do a lot of the teaching? Teaching each other, right? It's a brilliant way to actually go about it. And as uh, Eric Mazur founded the idea of peer, peer instruction, and he found out that nothing clarifies an idea better than explaining it to others. And we know this, we know this from experience. So these are some snaps from my afternoon classes at Kansai Gaidai with my foreign students. This is a business class, but they're actually doing total quality management rather than just listening to me talk about it. And they can have fun. This is uh, role playing. These two, <laughs> yeah, these two uh, students from Germany were very happy to play the roles, no problem. Uh, Students, there's a student from France explaining uh, Hofstede's dimensions but and using paper in a cube, not PowerPoint. They could have used PowerPoint, but they decided, no, we're not going to do that. Students here uh, singing a song about labor management issues that they wrote. They didn't have to do that. That's something they did. So they did lots of different things in class. So as Missouri says, you can forget facts, but you cannot forget understanding. And there are many different ways to have students come to actually understand. Now moving is very important, too. I tried to have you move a little bit. But we don't do enough for that. But you can do it even in a lecture hall. This is a, uh, I was lecturing, or not lecturing, I was speaking at Oxford. And someone took this picture. And then a little bit later, they're not leaving. They're actually engaging, and they're doing something. So we have to move. And they're very open to this, doing this kind of thing. Here at Kansai Gaidai, you can see students up and moving. You can do that in a lecture hall. But what about multimedia? How many of you have ever used multimedia in class as a student, as a teacher? And when you think of multimedia, you might think of PowerPoint. Or Prezi, which is much better, as we know. <laughs> Sorry. Now, speaking about PowerPoint, going back to John Medina, he says we should toss our PowerPoint. And the reason is it looks like this. And this leads to this. <laughs> and we don't want to do that. You think I'm kidding, but this is an actual picture I took. I won't say who it is, very famous politician there. This was a very important presentation, two hours. After 10 minutes, I took this picture, sleeping, sleeping, <laughs> sleeping. It's very, very normal. And people say, why do Japanese sleep on the trains? Now you know. PowerPoint, PowerPoint. <laughs> well, stop it. I'd like to play another little uh, audio or uh, video clip. This is from the Lecture Fail Project from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Students sent in their, well, their ideas about the college lecture. And here's what they had to say. Just a few clips. I've had a lot of boring class lectures. I'd say most of my classes are pretty boring. I feel that the majority of my lectures are boring and the inspiring lectures are in the minority. If I have to sit through a lecture where there's a PowerPoint and the professor stands in front of the class, reads word for word off the slide, I'd fall asleep. That's not learning. <laughs> learning is more than the professor reading notes. I mean, if that's all they were doing, then why don't we just print it out? I, I had one professor that read word for word through his PowerPoints. And I mean, that's just not the point of a PowerPoint. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just so a different way of using um, technology. I don't think a lot of professors um, use it well too much a lot of the time, unfortunately. So many professors do not use PowerPoint well. So visuals should be visuals. This is the idea. If you use PowerPoint or whatever uh, software you use, it should be visual. And I learned this when I was 17, when I was in biology class and I studied photography for the first time. And we used something called, you know what, this, raise your hand if you know what this is. Go ahead, raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Look around the room. These are very old people. <laughs> OK, this is called film. Yeah, this guy's like, well, I've never seen that. And I made a presentation, multimedia presentation. Raise your hand if you've seen this. You know what this is? You know what the name? Yeah, Re again, old people everywhere. <laughs> so many old, we have it. Yeah, these are called 
slides, and this is what I used for my first multimedia presentation. Now, <laughs> now let's say you had to give a presentation on the geisha culture, the history uh, of geisha in Kyoto and Kyoto culture, what would you do? Well, in the old days, we would do something like this, but now in the PowerPoint culture, of course, your professor might do this. Okay? <laughs> it's a visual, keep it visual. So this is what I learned back, I won't say 19, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my professor or my teacher told me, look, you're, it's a science presentation, but it's about storytelling, a harmonious blend of images, narration, evidence, and support. I still remember what he said, and this is a very, very long time ago. And of course, we've learned a lot over the years. When I worked at Apple, I learned a lot from observing the Yoda. He's the Yoda of presentations. <laughs> of course, make it big, very, very visual, very big, very simple, even if it's a technical topic. And he was great at using comparison. This is great, before, after, big, small, and so on. That helps understanding when you are talking. And of course, everyone knows Hans Rosling. There's not a time to play that now, but I, he is, well, actually, he's, he's the Yoda of today. He's the Yoda of presenting data, and he's amazing. We Let's don't have time, see. but I know a lot of you have seen that before. And one technique, then, is to prepare analog. These are my students. I didn't tell them to do this, but they thought, <laughs> that's a good use of a PC. Why not? And this is my daughter, who I guess she's copying me, so she's preparing her presentation. And this is a, um, a, a, a designer and an entrepreneur in Paris where I was recently, and he showed me this is how he does his presentation. Does it out on paper first, scans it, and then voila, in Keynote. That's just one way. There are many, many, many techniques, but getting, going analog can really help. And then, of course, getting close to the audience, not hiding behind the lectern and the computer and everything else. And my students do this. This is one of my students from Finland who doesn't, you know, the schools will say, hide behind this box. So you don't even have to wear pants, right? No one knows. Just hiding there. But he said, no, I'm not using that. I'm going to get out and connect with the students and be close to things. This is an actual lecture hall that I was invited to speak at. So put the computer down low, remove the barriers, go into the audience to get close. And then finally, the idea of smile. So that's one of our themes today. So that's where I'm going to, to close. And there's a group, some of you may know. You know who these guys are? Say, say, no. Yeah, that's dreams come true. Yoshida Miwa and uh, Nakamura uh, uh, Masa. And I've been doing some work with them over the, this past year relating presentation skills and the lessons from entertainers, especially from dreams come true. One of the things that these two guys do is their smile. You know the difference between a fake smile and a real smile, right? Where is it? How do you tell when someone's really smiling? It's in the eyes, isn't it? So you can see, look at that. The eyes are all scrunched up. You're really into it. I have a lot of wrinkles. I'm only 20 years old, but I smile a lot. <laughs> Watch it. He doesn't. OK, anyway. So this is my daughter when she was one years old doing a fake smile. And this is the real smile. You see the difference there? Fake, real, <laughs> fake. And that was last year and just a few days ago. So there's the, re the real smile. And then a miracle, it's a bit of a miracle happened just yesterday. Our seven-week-old son had his first smile, which is an amazing amount of communication. The first weeks of a baby, of course, you know, it's wonderful, but they're just all over the place, right? But this connection, look at how much connection is that. I recognize mommy. The, you know, we have a connection. It's an amazing thing. So what if you took this spirit of smile and connection and took it to your class or to your lecture? Maybe you could change this class into this one. All right. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you.